He's been dancing. Not that I'm casting aspersions or anything like that. <laughs> you should have seen the, her, her and Chris, and she's like, oh, Terry, you don't pirouette, I guess, in front of your adult children, because it's like, kind of you. <laughs> Running. Oh, yeah. Sure. And Lester yeah, said, well, hey, you know what? Nobody was videotaping it, so did it really happen? <laughs> you know where the camera field of view is and you stepped outside. Yes, I did. Well, actually, I did it twice. Once over there by your cookies, which I was really going, no, seven seconds, not enough time for a cookie. <laughs> See, if you're watching online, you're missing out on the cookies. There's like cookies and these Dancing. little brownie looking things that are a little different than <laughs> the Denny was like he wasn't sure about him this morning he, he wasn't yeah. sure if he was gonna have to well, just it. sneak it into a napkin and get rid of it or... take two to... <coughs> but he ate both of them so they must be very good so <laughs> see now I've got I there see go, there we go. thank you Rick There's a I, I'll live vicariously right at the moment through him and then I'll go over there when we're done here Missing out on the dancing pastors. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is meant to be a very joyous day as we are on the eve of our Savior's birth. Yes. So, to all of you that are here in person, welcome. To those of you that are online, we are so thankful that you could join us that way. Um, if you are watching online, please pop into the comments and just say hi so that we know that you are with us. Now today is another one of those busy days. We like to have those here at Grace Street. Tonight at eight o'clock, as we can see on the screen, we are having our candlelight service, and this is going to be a wonderful time for us to come together and worship our King, Jesus Christ, with the service of lessons and carols. And when we say candlelight by the end of the service, outside of the lights around the top of the ceiling and our candles, that's what will be lit up. Now, we do need a little bit of help before you all leave today. For those of you that are here right now, we're going to break out the candles, and we're going to break out the batteries, and we're going to have you put them all together for us, save us a little bit of time for later. So thank you for being voluntold, and we appreciate your service. Well, I do have, we do have one that has, to, has a, an engagement that they need to get to, so you are excused. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Besides, we talked him into coming tonight, so. He could be on the blowing out of the candles tonight. Yeah, he can blow them out and can take the batteries out and blow it out. There we go. Yes, we use battery-powered candles because we don't want to burn the place down. Um, this week, we are slowing down a little bit, so there will not be any Bible study this Wednesday night. However, we've got some special things that we are planning. Send the devious little caps. Um, and it's not devious at all. It's, it's a, we are planning a kickoff on January 3rd, the first Wednesday in the new year, which is a week and a half away. Le well, less than that, a week uh, tomorrow. And we're going to get together and we're going to do some things. So watch your email, watch our website, watch our social media for an announcement of exactly what is coming. Um, we're just fine-tuning the last pieces of that, but it's meant to be a time of fellowship, just coming together and enjoying what each other's company while having a little bit of fun at the same time. Then that following Saturday, January 6th, we're going to be busy again. we got a doubleheader that day. Um, we're going to have men's breakfast at 9 o'clock on the 6th, and then that evening, we'll be showing the bridge to Terabithia. And so we've talked about this a lot, but when you were a teen, you remember your life getting turned upside down by whatever it was that you got your life turned upside down by. Well, this young man befriends the new girl in school. And they come together and they imagine this whole new fantasy world so that they can escape reality. And uh, some of you may or may not have had those invisible friends as a kid. Think that. So um, if you want to know more about that and you're watching online, please go out to the website, click on Grace Street. Yeah, I'm pointing. You can't see what I'm pointing at, but get out to the website. In the upper right-hand corner, you will see the Grace Street Cinema. I click on that, and you can watch the trailer for that. It's also going to be at the end of today's worship music in the link for that. That'll be going in here shortly. And um, we'll have more about that.
about that as we get closer. So please join us for that. It's free. It's a free movie, free concessions. That includes hot dogs, brownie bites, cookies, and a whole <laughs> bunch of other stuff. So we look forward to having you join us for that. And then, five weeks after that, I can't believe we're getting this close. Mm -hmm. And I managed to get a bow on the front of it. It's got a bow on it. <laughs> little Christmas gift. But February 10th, we kick off season 19. And it's just incredible to me how we got to that point. 19 years, it seems like just yesterday that we started. Um, beyond that, uh, Diane will be putting a link in the chat for those of you that are watching online for today's worship music set. Mark's picked some great songs for us to sing today, so please click that link after the service and just enjoy that music. And the great thing about those links is they're there that you can click on them tomorrow and the next day and the next day and just keep enjoying them all the time. So uh, we thank you for that. And with that, we come to the end of our announcements. Father God, we just thank you for the beautiful day that you've given us. Yes, it is a little rainy out, but it's also in the 50s, which we didn't expect, Father. Just a year ago, we were dealing with single digits uh, hovering right around zero. So we are thankful uh, that we can go out and be safer on the roads and not have ice to deal with. But certainly, we do miss that white Christmas uh, as we've come to appreciate. Father, we thank you that as we go through the day today, we are preparing. We're concluding this awesome uh, series that you provided for us by the Nativity. We're ending with a wonderful uh, message from Pastor Mark, Father, that you gave him on why to call him Savior. And we just thank you for that. Let us hear your words, Father. Let us meditate on them after we leave here today and use that to continue living our lives as we grow closer and closer to you, becoming more and more Christ-like as you have called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This morning's call to worship comes from Isaiah 9, 6 through 8. Is it Luke? Then that is, I was going off what was on the screen. <laughs> That's okay. We're going to jump to Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. How about that? You know, I don't feel so bad now because I messed up giving, putting the wrong number up there last week. So I think Mark's just making me feel better. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Luke 2, 10 and 11 says, Then the angel said to them, Can you imagine this? So put yourself in the middle of nowhere. And it's dark, and all that you have around you, a few other shepherds and a bunch of sheep. Now, now that you got the vision, the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The angel of the Lord had just announced the greatest event in all of history. The Messiah, Jesus, had been born. Now, it's interesting to note that when you read this and you see uh, the wordings in it, he's gone out, the angel appeared to the shepherds first. The lowest of the low. This is the greatest event ever. And I, when I first started writing or uh, making some notes about this, it was the, the best and greatest event ever, past, present, and future. And then I thought, mm, with one caveat, the second coming when Jesus returns will be even greater because those that are not with him yet will then have believed in him will be raised up with him. This is the announcement the Jews have been waiting for. This is the indication because he went, they, the angel of the Lord went to the lowest of the low in Jewish society that this message is for everyone. 
everyone that is willing to accept Jesus into their hearts, this is for us. He accepts us right where we are. We say that a lot. Come as you are. Jesus accepts you right where you're at. But here's just a little hint into the good news. Because we're accepting the Holy Spirit into our hearts, he doesn't leave us that way. We're changed. This morning, Pastor Mark is going to guide us through answering a question. And that is, why call him Savior? This may be, and it probably will be, the, well, it's kind of like the cherry on top of the Sunday. It's going to be the, we've been building to this point since week one. <coughs> and this is going to be an amazing time as we go and hear this message. Father, let us hear this message. Let us understand why we call your son Jesus Savior, why it means so much to us. Father, thank you that you accept us how we are, where we're at. But even more so, Father, thank you that you don't leave us there. Thank you that this message is for everyone. Everyone has the opportunity to accept your message, accept your son as their personal savior and be lifted up and given hope, peace, joy, and love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning. How is everyone this morning? You're welcome. It's great to see you all here today. Well, today, as we come into our time of our Advent candles and our candle lighting this morning, Today we light the love candle, which is the fourth in the series of candles until later on this afternoon. Our candlelight service will be lighting the Christ candle. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, that is a great statement because it tells us what our future is going to look like. If we put our faith in Christ that we have eternal life. We have something more than just being born, living, and dying. We've got somewhere to go. We have somewhere to be with. And that, I think, is one of the greatest gifts of all time. And this is probably the, the most widely known verse out of the entire Bible. You know, you see it flashed in ballparks everywhere, memorized for Sunday school lessons as kids. But why is this so beloved? Because it tells us about God's love for us. See, it's a gift given for us freely and openly. And the reason that the Father sent his Son to be with us on Christmas Day, that's the whole purpose behind it, because he loved us so much that he sent his Son. Everything else had failed up to this point. I don't want to get into my sermon yet. But everything else had failed up to this point. That God had done. He'd sent judges and he'd sent prophets and he'd done all these things and miraculous signs and wonders to the people and they still fell away. See, he gave his one and only son that Christmas morning. But why? Because he loved us, the world that he created so much. Not the physical globe itself, not the, the, the physical earth itself, but the people that he created, all of us, all of us. See, he created struggling, confused, exuberant, depressed, striving, and sinful people, and he loved them all. He loved them all. See, he loves us. That's why Jesus came. That's the meaning. That is the reason for the season. That's it in a nutshell. I'm done. No. Uh, in that way, then, Jesus relates to all the hurting people because we can see that love, that compassion, those great words that he has. My daughter to the woman that he touched the hem of his garment and was healed after ble bleeding out for all those years. His encouragement to Peter who betrayed him. And he said, feed my sheep. Peter, I haven't given up on you. You're the rock on which I'm going to build my church. 
See, his passion for the crowds, he saw himself as a shepherd for all the sheep, all the flock, all the people of the world, no matter who they are. He was there to shepherd them back to God. Jesus came on Christmas morning out of the Father's love for you, for me, and for all. And in spite of persecution, in spite of the crucifixion, which was an absolutely excruciating, painful process to go through, that's where that word came from. It was invented to describe being crucified, excruciating pain, crucified. See, even history of the saints and sinners inside and outside the church, through everything that has gone on, his love is undiminished in this Advent season. He is the reason for the season. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for your undeserved love that envelops us and saves us, that fills us with your spirit and includes in us the momentous plans for your kingdom. Thank you for loving us today. Thank you for being our Savior, the Christ, the Savior of the world. As we come into your presence this morning, as in this time of worship, we ask that you would open our ears to hear, open our eyes to see the wonders that you've done for us each and every day. Open our hearts to receive your message into us and to live it out each and every day. Father, remove me from myself and just fill me full of your glory, full of your spirit today so that I can bring honor and glory in this message, this Christmas Eve, right before you send your son to us. Let us open our hearts to hear that message today. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. So this is Christmas Eve. Kind of the pinnacle that we wait for for at least half the year, right? Because we got Easter on the other side. But Christmas Eve... So for most people in the world, it means that we got a lot of present shopping to do, we got gifts to wrap, we got busyness of all kinds, there's craziness in, inside the, the everything. <laughs> everything. So Christmas Eve is kind of the culmination of, it all comes together now. If you haven't done your Christmas shopping yet, you know, it's too late. Too late. I know people that wait until like today to do it. Craziness. But in the midst of all that, as I said in the, in the Advent candlelighting message in here, in the midst of all that, why should we call Christ Savior? Why call him Savior? Why? We come to know Jesus by quite a few names in our Christian journey. And the incomparable Lord Jesus was called the Lamb of God, the Man of Sorrows, the Prince of Peace, Good Shepherd, Mighty God, Bright morning star, Emmanuel, day spring, rock, judge, bread of life, king of kings, teacher, the light of the world, servant, and the only way to heaven. Oh, by the way, that's just a few of the names. But what's in a name? <clears throat> you know, we all have names. Some of us have names, and then we have nicknames, and then we get called names that sometimes may not fit us real well, we think. And we assign meaning to these names depending upon the situation and our understanding of the given situation in our life at that time. The Bible uses more than 300 names, 300 names, titles to describe Jesus himself. But Jesus can no more be contained in a name, in just a name or a title, than containing the entire ocean in a collection of beautiful bottles. It just can't be done. But God had foretold the coming of Jesus in the message that he gave through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 9, 6 through 8 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given. The government will rest upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. See, and then we, we, we listen to that, and this, this message was given to the people 
675 years before the birth of Christ. Think about that. God's given us, hey, you talk about getting a heads up. He gave us a heads up 675 years before Christ was even born. But he goes on further in Micah 5, 3 through 5, he says, But you, O Bethlehem, Epaphrathah, are only a small village among the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from the distant past. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. And then at last, then at last, his fellow countrymen will return from their exile to their own land. And he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world, and he will be given the source of peace. So when we think about these things, you know, you're looking for a heads up for what's going to happen later on today. You know, that's my age, that's what I'm doing. But God gave us this heads up six and seven hundred years in advance through the prophets that he is going to send his son to be our savior. Our savior. What does that mean? Well, it means that we are no longer dead in our sins. No longer dead in our sins. Because Jesus is going to lift us out of that sinfulness. And he's going to give us a path to everlasting life. All we have to do is accept it, have faith, and believe that he is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. That's it. It doesn't cost us any money. It's free. You don't have to pay a price. You don't have to do any good works to get it done. See, it's not by works that it's done. It's by God's grace, and I'll get to that in more in a minute. See, here God is telling the people of Israel to have hope. That he's going to deliver them from bondage that they're subjected to. And as we look through the Bible, we see the bondage that the people of Israel have been through. Physical bondage. But this is spiritual bondage. This is sin that are keeping them separated from God. It's a chasm that separates them. And he's closing that gap. He was foretelling of them of being released from their sins as well. And he sent an angel to Joseph, as we heard last week. And just a few months from Jesus' birth, he sent him in Matthew 1, 21. He says, tells us that God reiterated that same promise that we just heard from Isaiah and from Micah. He sends it and he gives it to Joseph from an angel. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. See, if you look in all the Old Testament stuff, it, it, you got to read between the lines. But here, it's pretty darn clear. God sent the angel and he says, this is why I'm sending Jesus down. This is why he is here. Here God comes right out and tells us he's sending us a savior. No guesses. He calls him out by name. So for over a thousand years, God's been trying to get his people on board and get them with the program. And they rejected. They rejected his messages. They rejected his messengers throughout that whole time, thousands of years. And we didn't get it. How many times did he have to tell us? It's kind of like, how many times are you supposed to forgive? 70 times 7, right? In other words, unendingly. And yes, there are a few throughout time who listened and obeyed, but the majority of the people didn't. So he split up Israel and sent them out into foreign lands. And God sent his messengers of hope 650 years in advance, foretelling of that birth of Jesus telling the people that he had a plan for them and to have faith and to believe. He told them through the prophets where and in effect when it would happen. This birth of the Savior would bring the nation of Israel to restoration through Christ. Through Christ. The Savior Jesus, he sent the message to distant lands through distant peoples. 
was signs that would appear and lead these wise men from the other nations to be there and bear witness to the birth that had been foretold many, many, many years before. So why is this important? Because Jesus was coming to be the savior of the entire world, not just of Israel, not just of the Jewish people, but of all people throughout all of the lands, throughout all the earth that God had created. So he spoke to the Israelites, but more than that, he gave that same message then to the world. See, the Jews just thought the Savior was only for them. He was just going to come and he was going to save them. But God's plan is much bigger than one group of people. God's message of salvation includes everyone who believes and has faith in Christ the Lord. So in my take, it seemed as though God was saying, You, O Israel, you've had deaf ears. So now I will speak to the entire world. And so he did, giving signs to other nations that a savior was at hand. These nations then sent their emissaries to pay homage to the baby Jesus being born. It meant so much to them, they took on a three-year voyage in advance. See these signs and wonders? These wise men that traveled from other worlds and from other countries? Do you know that it took them three years to get there, to pay homage to Christ? They were on foot. They traveled thousands of miles just to pay homage to him because God had sent signs and wonders to them. So they understood and they then fulfilled the prophecies. Over 333 prophecies were fulfilled in the birth, life, and death of Christ Jesus the Savior. So the message is written in Luke about the promise of the Savior. For unto you this born, or born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So Jesus was born into a purpose. He was to be the sign that God was fulfilling his promises through Jesus. Both Luke and John tell of the purpose for which Jesus was to fulfill. And when Jesus was in Jericho, he saw a chief tax collector there. And he was the chief tax collector for the entire region. So I think we all know how well these people were held in esteem in the society of those days. Right? Traitors. Well, his name was Zacchaeus. He made great wealth at the expense of his fellow Jewish people great wealth. And so Jesus was coming into Jericho and he saw Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a very short man or short stature as the scripture tells us. And so what he did was he climbed a tree because he wanted to see who this Jesus was as he was coming into town. So he got up in a tree and Jesus called to him in that tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, you got to come down because you're going to have dinner for us at your house tonight. How's that for a meeting? <laughs> Hi there. I just met you, by the way. We're going to eat at your house. <clears throat> See, this greatly upset them, the Jewish people who were in that <coughs> region, because of how Zacchaeus had treated them. But what happened right then and there? Zacchaeus repented in the presence of Jesus, and he said he would give half of his wealth to the poor, and if he cheated of any other people, he would give them four times as much back. Well, why does that matter? But Jesus, in doing that, and, in, and taking that repentance from Zacchaeus, putting it upon his heart to be repentant, well, see, that gave him a glimpse of what he was there for. And so he told them, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. So we have this despised tax collector. They were people who were Jewish, who the Romans employed to come and tax the people. Well, you know, the Romans tax was bad enough. But see, on top of that, these tax collectors, they would add on, so they had a little more. They'd skim off the top, 
And they got, became very, very, very wealthy at the expense of their very own people. So they were despised. They were hated by the Jewish people. And here Jesus says, salvation has come to his home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. A true son of Abraham, meaning that he was a good Jew in that community. Because of what he did, he repented of his sinful ways just at the sight of Jesus, just at the presence of Jesus. <clears throat> Salvation will come to those who have lost their way. When we are truly lost, our lives seem dark, and we really can't get a clear vision of what our future is. And it seems as though the whole world is against us, and we live in that darkness. Anybody ever been there? I'm raising both my hands because I've been there too many times. When you live that out day to day, year to year, in subrogation, you lose hope. You lose faith. You begin to think that God has forgotten about you. And again, that darkness overtakes you. It's a bad place to be. It's a bad place to have to try and live your life out day to day. No hope. No faith. Nothing. Nothing. A lot of people take it upon their hearts. It gets so bad that they end up taking their own lives. It's a bad place to be. I've been there. I've lived it. You don't want to go through that. So John tells us why Jesus was needed to come to the world. John 1 says, In the beginning the Word already existed, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. And nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life what brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness can never extinguish it. Now, we're told that Jesus is the Word of God. He is the Word in flesh. He is the living Word of God. So what that means to us in here and what John is telling us, that Jesus is the light of the world to bring us out of those dark times, to bring us out of our sin, to bring us out of our, our troubles and our times where we are so desperate. Bad relationships. Bad relationships. That darkness that you can't seem to overcome any other way. We have to call on the name of Jesus because, because when we have Jesus in our hearts, guess what? He is the light of the world. He brings us out of that darkness. We don't have to stay there because of him. And all we have to do is have faith and we have to believe that he is who he is and he's going to do what he says he can do. Dr. David Jeremiah tells us when we think of being saved, we, we picture sailors clinging onto the wreckage of a ship, helicopters hovering over the sky in the night, shining their beacons on the sea in search of the living. We think of a collapsed coal mine where workers are trapped beneath the earth. Their oxygen runs low. The men crouch in darkness wondering if they dare hope for salvation. We think of that little girl at the bottom of the well we think about a Coast Guard who sends sailors out to the lost sailors. We send rescuers out to the miners and they won't be abandoned. And the little girl must see the sunshine once more. See, these are all temporal situations. They're transcended by the tragedy of the people that are lost and the rubble of their own sin and the rubble of their own darkness. They're in pain and often without knowing for it. They're lost people. They're crying out to be rescued. But until we're willing to admit that God is God, we fall short of that glorious perfection that he has for us. We sh fall short of those things that would bring us out of that darkness, out of those pits, out of that desperation. See, we're dead to our sins. We're just like the coal miners. We're just like those people in the sinking ship. We're just like that little girl at the bottom of the well. We need 
the salvation. We need a rescuer and God sent his son, Jesus. Jesus may have done for us what we can't do for ourselves. In his birth, in his death, in his resurrection, he lifts us out of that darkness and he gives us a way to eternity. Moreover, he gives us a personal relationship with God. He gives us that opportunity to be one-on-one -on -one with God. See, he doesn't force himself upon us. He paid the penalty for our sins, but waits for us to accept him by faith. His gift of eternal salvation. You see, salvation is present at all time, but being saved from our circumstance takes one thing. We need to do our part. Does that sound familiar? How many times have I said that? Probably a hundred times in the last year. And I know we've heard this many, many times, but there's a reason for it. Most people are sitting back and waiting for Jesus to just come and save him. Like he's just going to swoop right in and boom, salvation. That's what they're waiting for. So they don't have to do anything. And yes, God does pursue us always, but it's like you're walking down the street and God's there as well. But you don't know he's there. Because you're so busy with all the distractions of the world, you don't recognize that God is with you every step of the way in your life. we got to reach our hand out and take his hand in ours. That's called faith. Sometimes it's called a leaf of faith. We have to do our part. We have to reach out to God and say, God, please, I'm at the bottom of my pit. I'm in darkness. I need your light to come in and make my life whole again. But the problem is, we don't recognize that God is with us because we're so distracted. Then something really goes wrong. And what do we do? We call out to God to save us. God, if you just get me out of this one thing, one time, I'll be faithful from here on out the rest of my life. We use God as a crutch. We don't take time to have that relationship with God. And that's what the whole point is. We have to have a relationship with God. You can't use God as a crutch only when it's convenient. I use this illustration because I think that's where the people of Israel were when God sent Jesus to them. They would use God as a crutch when they got really, really down and in a really bad situation. They would finally call out to God. And he would always answer them. But see, for thousands of years, they used God as a crutch. And so he sent Jesus. See, he, he sent Jesus to come down, to be relational with the people that he created. He needed to be in their midst so they understood that God was real. He's the real deal. In their midst. I would love to be there. <laughs> I really would. But see, the neat thing is, God tells us that whenever two or more of us are gathered together in his name, here he is amongst us. So he's here with us today. Thank God. Literally, thank God. See, God brought Jesus to show the people he'd always been there. Always. Always. He'd been fulfilling the prophecies he had given the people for centuries. God had laid a foundation for the entry of Jesus into this broken world. He became a humble babe, not come riding in on a, on a high <coughs> horse, a white horse with flowing robes. He came in born into a manger, a stable. He came as a humble babe. His birth foretold so there could be no mistake that he was the one and only son of God. See, in spite of our rebellion, he gave us away a gift, the greatest gift we could ever want. He gave us a way for him to join with him in eternity. The birth of Jesus was also the foundation for eternity. For unto you is born a Savior. Jesus Christ is our Savior. 
God entered into humanity so that humanity would be able to enter into eternity. The birth of Jesus, while it happened at a certain point in time, started something that will never end. Jesus was the beginning of that eternal relationship with God. He was the light of the world forever. Forever. All we have to do is accept it. I want you to think before you open your first Christmas present that you're going to be receiving. And I'm sure everybody's going to get one. I want you to think about the greatest gift that was ever given. And this is what I'm talking about today. Everything else pales in comparison. Everything else. I mean, trust me, the new socks and the new underwear and those kind of things are, you know, necessities. But see, this transcends anything that we get wrapped up in a, in a, in a package with a bow. So Dr. Jeremiah provides us a wonderful story to illustrate salvation. In the mountains of Virginia, there existed a one-room schoolhouse where no teacher had lasted more than two weeks. Mean-spirited boys, there's, I, I don't know about this, mean-spirited boys thought their main objective in life was to run off everyone who tried to be a teacher for them in school. So one day, a young teacher applied for the job, and the director of the school said, Son, because of your age, you're going to take an awful beating. <laughs> well, said the teacher, I'm going to risk it. So on his first day, he walked into the classroom and noticed that the kids had gathered around this guy named Tom, big old Tom. And he was the class bully. So loud enough so the new teacher could hear him, big old Tom said, now I'll take care of this one. I won't need anyone's help. He's going to be gone by the end of the day. By the end of the day, when the young teacher stood before the class and said, I have come to conduct this class, but I must confess, I can't do it without your help. We need a few rules, and I want you to help me. What rules do you think we ought to have? Wow. Well, such a suggestion had never happened before. So as the teacher went to the blackboard, one kid hollered, no stealing. The teacher wrote on the board, no one can be late. He added it to the list. And by the time he had finished, 10 rules were instituted to which everybody in the classroom agreed to. They made their own rules. Kind of neat, huh? Well, they laughed out loud because they saw all these rules that they had up on the board. Now, the teacher said, there's no such thing as a good rule without a penalty if it's broken. So big old Tom stood up and said, whoever breaks one of these rules gets 10 licks across his bare back. And the te teacher thought at that point, hey, well, that's, that's a little bit severe. And obviously the story is dated. Nobody used the term licks anymore. But he agreed. So on the following day, big Tom told the teacher, somebody stole my lunch. So the teacher said, class, one of our rules, no stealing. Somebody stole Big Tom's lunch. And I want to know who. After everybody had been questioned, a little 10-year-old boy stood up and said, I stole his lunch. But I was so <coughs> hungry, I couldn't help it. Well, the teacher said, you know the penalty. Ten licks across your bare back. Well, a little boy began to beg. He said, teacher, please don't do that. Whatever you do, don't make me take off my coat. But the teacher, knowing that he was on trial, made the young boy unbutton his coat. And underneath there was no shirt, just suspenders holding up his pants. And the teacher thought to himself, how am I going to whip this child? That if I don't, I'll forever lose control of this class. So he said to that boy, son, how is it that you have no undershirt? And the boy answered, well, my father died. My mom's real sick. We're real poor. I only have one shirt. And today is that day when that shirt gets washed. So I'll have my shirt tomorrow but I don't have it today. 
Well, the teacher slowly got the paddle, and while mustering up the courage to inflict that punishment on that little boy, Big Little Tom stood up. He jumped over everybody in his way, and he went up to the front of the class. He said, teacher, if you don't object, I'm going to take the licking for him. See, that teacher made some philosophical statement about the right to substitute for punishment, and off came Tom's coat. And after five hard strokes, the teacher paused and realized that everyone was hanging and crying, especially Jim the little boy who stole the lunch. Because Tom was taking punishment. Tom. A little jump came up and he hung on Big Tom's neck for all he was worried. And he cried, Tom, I'm awful sorry I stole your lunch. I was so hungry. I'll love you till the day I die. I'll love you till the day I die. And it broke the teacher's heart. See? And that day, Tom, you had become little Jim's savior. You and I have broken the rules, haven't we? We alone cannot achieve salvation. We're dead in our sins. We Jesus. As we prepare for Christmas Day, as this season of Advent comes to a close, we need to take time to reflect on this. The Lord Jesus came into our classroom. He took off his coat. He stretched himself out on a wooden beam. And he took those stripes that were served for us. And then that day, he became our Savior. On that day, he became our Savior. Tomorrow we celebrate the birth of Jesus. For unto us, this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, is born. See, Christ the Lord, that word Christ, translates to Savior. So each time we talk about Christ Jesus, we are talking about Savior Jesus. Names mean things. So I have a question for you today. Do you know him as your Savior? It's not enough just to believe that he is the Savior of the world. You must acknowledge that because of your sin, you deserve God's punishment. And then you must trust in Jesus as your Savior to take that punishment from you, for you and be a savior from God's wrath. Again, we must do our part to express our desire to be saved. Pray from your heart, not just from your lips. Words are empty. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for me. That's what I deserve and I know it. Today I accept your punishment for my sin and receive your forgiveness. I accept you into my heart and into my life to be my Savior. Let this day be the day when you invite Christ to be your own personal Savior and your Lord Jesus. See, the best Christmas gift of all time is waiting for you to reach out your hand to say the words, Christ Jesus, be my Savior today. Read with me on the screen if you would. Let us pray. Dear Father God, I know there's nothing that I can do to merit my salvation or to gain your forgiveness. Thank you that you have offered me the free gift of salvation by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Thank you that Jesus chose to pay the full price for my sin and that you have accepted his death on the cross as payment for my sin. Lord Jesus, I ask you in, to take you into my heart today to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for giving up your life on the cross for me and forgiving all of my sins. 
Today I reject Satan's influence on my life and I return to Jesus for my salvation this very day. Thank you, God, for loving me and for saving me. God, I choose to live for you from now on. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. This comes from chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, as Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. This is the passion version, so it's a little bit different than what you're normally used to hearing. But it says this, my cherished friends, keep on running far away from idolatry. I know I'm writing to thoughtful people, so carefully consider what I say. For when we pray for the blessing of the communion cup, <coughs> isn't this? our co-participation with the blood of Jesus. And the bread that we distribute, isn't this the bread of our co-participation with the body of Christ? For although we're many, we become one loaf of bread and one body as we feast together on one loaf. Paul continues at chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 23, and says, I have handed down to you what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. And when I read that, I keep thinking of when we hear messages from God, that we are what we are to teach, preach. When Denise hears from the Lord what she is to pray about, we all hear God differently, and together we are given his direct revelation. It continues, it says, the same night in which he was handed over, he took bread and gave thanks. Then he distributed it to the disciples, saying, take it and eat your fill. It is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. <coughs> did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, this cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it. And whenever you drink this, do it to remember me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're retelling the story proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes. Today as we take communion, it's like the exclamation point on today's message. God sent Jesus to take our place and to receive the punishment that we deserve. He became our personal Savior. For those of you that are, are new today or haven't used these cups before, you want to take, then open the narrow end on the bottom first so that you don't end up with the juice all over you. The body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. <clears throat> we prepared to bring Denise up here for the prayer of the people. I just want to thank everyone for all the prayers that you give for the church and for the people in this church. And I don't know what God has planned for us. We've said it in weeks past, we don't know what's coming in the next minute, let alone next week or next month or next year. But God is doing a work amongst you. Let him in and let him work in <laughs> Looking forward to hearing what you have for us this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see everybody.
everybody here this morning. Wow. We are truly blessed today. And I thank everyone for coming this morning. So, um, and I want to thank you for your sermon. It was very heartfelt. Thank you so much. So I'm here for prayers for the people. And if anybody would ask for prayer, I'm going to pray for people. And, um, Mark, I do want to know your sister's name. Father God, we praise and honor you today because we are fearfully and wonderfully created by you. You know our inmost being. You perceive our thoughts from afar. You first loved us, as it states in 1 John 4, 10 through 12. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Therefore, we pray for one another and help one another as the body of Christ is living in us. Father God, we lift up Diane and Jen to you today. We ask that you strengthen their bodies, hearts, and minds. Heal them and comfort them, Father God. Put Christian people in their paths that will help them with their daily struggles. Help them to lean on your word to see them through. Father God, we lift up Joe and Mark. You alone know their needs. We ask that you supersede in their healing, Lord Jesus. Father God, we lift up Bill and Vicki. We thank you for their for them, Jesus, and ask that you carry them through each day and give them courage and endurance to fight the battle they are facing. Father, we love our children and our grandchildren as you do. Please teach us to help them understand the power of knowing you and your love, the hope that it gives us, and to know the promise of your salvation. Lord Jesus, we pray for the homeless today that you will give them provision to sustain them night and day and keep them warm and safe from the evil that lurks in the darkness, whether it be physical or mental. And Father, we pray for those here and online dealing with the loss of a loved one this year, or maybe your loved one is in the hospital fighting for their life. We ask the Holy Spirit to surround them with the love of Christ. You are our tower of refuge in times of great need. You created each one of us for a purpose, Father. Lift them out of their sadness or depression. Give them courage to face each new day. Help them to know they, are, they never walk alone. You promise to always be with us, but we need to pray and invite you into our lives so that we can feel your presence and know who you created us to be. Help them to read your word because it is a guide to life everlasting. You give hope to the hopeless, joy and peace to all who find you. There is power in your name, Jesus. And Father God, help us to pray for Israel and to know that you are in control. God, bless them and keep them each day and walk with them. And during this holiday season, help all to remember the true meaning of Christmas. The reason we celebrate is because you were born to show us to live, to save us from our sins. Such a beautiful and marvelous gift of love you have given to all of us. Help us to cherish this gift and celebrate you, Jesus. Help us to pass this love to others so we feel the true meaning of Christmas. You are a great and mighty God, and we are truly blessed by your gift of love. And praise be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Denise. But I got to tell you, your prayers each week are a true gift. Uh, you've been truly blessed. Before we close out our online portion of the service this morning, I'm going to throw a curveball back there at Chris. There is a video there if you would like to go ahead and show it. And it's from Dr. David Jeremiah, the one who created Why the Nativity. And it's his closing message for us as we uh, close out our time. And so, 
So we'll just listen to this message really quick from Dr. Jeremiah. Simply put, why the nativity? You. Let Christmas awaken you to your need for a savior. The nativity is a picture of God offering to redeem us through his son and offer to tell all people from every land. So however or whenever God speaks to you, there's no better time to awaken to a fresh start by giving your life to Jesus Christ. So as we close out this time of worship today, our online portion of the worship, I do invite you to listen to the songs uh, that I've curated for this week. Uh, hopefully that will speak to your hearts. And uh, there's a message in the music, and, and a lot of times that message speaks to us even deeper than just me standing in front of it and talking. Um, so last week I told you about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. See, he was in a very dark place. His first wife was killed in a fire. His new wife was uh, in very, very bad shape. She was very sick and then she was uh, on her deathbed. And his son was paralyzed from being wounded in the Civil War. And he was in a dark place. He was at that point where he was going to lose his faith. He was going to lose hope. Because he thought God had abandoned him. Then he heard the bells on Christmas Day. And it reminded him that the bells were ringing and giving him hope as it was ringing out their song of hope and of love, and that God was ever with him. And it reminded him that God was there for him. In his despair, he had written, There is no peace on earth, I said, for the hate is strong, and mocks the song of peace on earth and goodwill to men. And he'd been locked in that despair for over two years, and his hope had faded away. But then he wrote, there is no peace on earth. And the fourth verse then shows his faith and hope in God that he had despite the darkness that surrounded him. He lost his peace and his hope for a season. But his faith prevailed because of those bells. Then the bells pealed more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth. Goodwill to man. In the midst of the darkness, he found light. He found his faith. He found hope again. Hope again. God revealed his hope back to him. He heard the bells and it reminded him that God was present in his loss, in his darkness. He didn't let his circumstances overcome his faith. It actually restored his hope. It restored his purpose back. My point is if we allow our circumstances to steal our joy and our hope, if we remain stuck in our circumstance, we can't reach out to God in the midst of that. We can't get the destiny that God has planned for us, eternal life with him. And so he sends the bells to peel out. Are you listening for the bells today? Are you listening for those bells today? So he can restore hope and peace and joy to our life. Amen.